Hi there, welcome my friend, welcome to Home Keepers. My name's Arthelene Rippey, show is Home Keepers, and that kind of just welcomes everybody. Maybe you've never seen the program before. Welcome aboard, and all those regular ones out there. I, I had a viewer call me just yesterday. She said, I watch you at 5.30 in the morning and 1 o'clock in the afternoon. God bless her, I've never watched me at 5.30 in the morning. But uh, we really appreciate you regular viewers, watch us every day. God bless you and we have a good program for you today for sure. My guest is Dr. Jeff Parker. He's a pastor, missionary, author, wrote a book called Killing the Church, uh, The Failure to Confront. I'm telling you, this is one of the finest books I've picked up in a long time. It is well written. It's something that's been on my own heart for a long time because growing up in the church, it's very easy to see what's happened to the standards and um, just sin can be rampant sometimes in the church and it's never addressed. This book addresses it. I'm anxious for you to meet this gentleman. And I'm going to join Stephanie. I'm going to tell her about a, a little dinner party I had for some friends, but as I was preparing and thinking, what will I serve? I remembered my mother-in-law, one of the finest people you would ever want to know. She's in heaven today. And she always fixed uh, for company an apricot gelatin, and I'd kind of forgotten about it. I thought, I'm going to fix that thing for my guests, and you know, I think they ate every bit of it. So I'm going to show you how to make it. It's a very nice addition to any meal. It's pretty. And also, I think, especially good with a chicken dish. So I'll show you how to make that. Before I do, I again want to offer you the book Freedom from Financial Fear by Dr. D. James Kennedy. I've mentioned to you several times that he was absolutely one of my favorites because he not only preached the gospel to his congregation, but he really truly tried to change the nation. And I have great, great admiration for him. Thankful that one time, probably 25 years ago, I got to interview him. We're offering you this book because most people are interested in finances. Jesus was. He sure talked about it a lot. And it's yours for the asking. Just write to me at Home Keepers, Box 6922, Clearwater, Florida, 33758. Please enclose the very best gift you can. If you absolutely cannot, I will send them as long as the uh, supply lasts. But if you can help us out this way, and we have offered up for other financial books, but this one is strictly lifted from scripture. And uh, that's the best way to go for sure. Hi, girl. Hi, how are you? Well, I'm doing good. good. Um, we need to, you have uh, two cups of liquid, mm -hmm. like you do for any um, gelatin. So this is apricot nectar. Apricot ne mm -hmm. nectar, yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's <coughs> that equals a cup and a half, mm -hmm. and we want it to um, boil up a little bit. we got the little yeah. <clears throat> and um, I think my dinner party was a success. We're friends who've been, uh, hadn't seen other, everybody together mm -hmm. for about 15 years. Wow. And uh, we prayed and we laughed a lot and um, talked about how good God is to his widows. That's we awesome. Just, yeah. And I fixed the garlic chicken thing we mm -hmm. did a few days mm -hmm. ago. They loved it, right? Oh, they demanded, and I did it, that email all the recipes the next nice. since I got to the office. So. Nice. <coughs> uh, including this one. So that's starting to yeah. um, Speaking of to friends, boil a little bit. Can yes. I do a, a little shout out real quick? Sure. I want to do a little shout out to my friend Barb from uh, Bonita Springs, Florida. Uh -huh. She sent me this absolutely beautiful bracelet it for is just so no cute. reason at all, just because is that so it's adorable? It is darling. I love it. So I just say thank you to her. I love her so much. We need to uh, find something like that for all of our friends I love out there. it. Isn't it fabulous? And okay, I'm nice. putting in, I think it's about four ounces mm -hmm. of cream cheese. Remember when the cream cheese came in the little things? They don't so much anymore. No, They're, it's like you, you get the eight ounce uh -huh. or nothing. Right? We don't want to stir that. We want it to boil. Okay. So I'm not it's stirring. Along. You could spray this. Okay. If you, <laughs> If you can, because that's usually my job. That is usually and, your uh, job. Not sure that she's capable. Let's <clears throat> see how I did, master. Okay, now if you'll <laughs> just pour some of that liquid in here. Sure. I have, uh, like I said, four ounces of cream cheese, and I got the deepest dish I could because it will fly. Split. Yeah, and then if you want to heat up the, the rest of yours just a little sure. bit, this is good enough. 
That'll do it. Okay. okay. So you'll need. Um... Oh. <laughs> I know. You know. I've only got it on one. Now, uh, then you want to dissolve that. Yes. That's uh, one package of lemon jello. Yeah, one package of lemon jello and the nectar. And just make sure it really dissolves. Yeah, that was in the directions. You need to make sure it all dissolves. And yeah. it's just the lemon. I call this Marie Rippey's apricot jello. I love it. Mmm, that smells good. Uh huh. Mmm. All right, that's about all you do to that. So you have cream cheese and uh, and part of the apricot nectar. And part of the apricot nectar. I have Jello and the other part of the apricot nectar. And then a half a cup of cold water. And a half a cup of cold water. So you can mix those together. Yep. So we're just going to mix everything together. And we let this sit out a little bit. Do you think it'll come out? <laughs> half a cup of cold water. Are we trading? Yes. Okay. <laughs> That way she'll be humiliated instead of yes, me. Yes, thank you. Let me just real quick. Okay. This is gonna be pretty. And you put it in, you know, whatever mold you like. But okay. I'm telling you. This it, is all Arthleen Rippy. If it doesn't come yeah, out, you made yeah. this, right? There it is. And you put that in the fridge and uh, mine came out real good. Yeah, I got nothing. <laughs> Sister, I got nothing here. Okay, let me try a little hot water. Okay. Talk to the people, okay? Talk to the people. Hi, people. No. <laughs> Quote a scripture. Oh, gosh. Don't put me under the gun. Ay, ay, ay. Okay, it's all you. What is that? Murphy's Law. Mine yep. came out so perfect for the... Shake it. Oh, let's Can get a knife in there. <laughs> oh, it's starting. Go. You're almost there. I can't believe this. <laughs> oh, no. Oh, no. I'm telling you, you got to believe me. Yeah, get that in there. Mine came out so perfectly. And if we, I would have made it, it might have come out. Did you spray uh -huh. it? Oh, I sprayed the. You got nothing, do you? Uh-uh. I have. I, <laughs> well, I'm going to show you what it looks like on the other there side. There you go. There, isn't that pretty? Isn't that, doesn't isn't that, that look tasty? I don't know what I I fix this thing so many times. Anyway, it's because we're on television I and we're on it. the spot. It's I crazy. know. It. I'm telling you, Saturday night that thing just just warming my hand on it a little bit. Anyway, there. <laughs> <laughs> if you want it, the information's coming up on your screen. And don't miss my guest Jeff Parker. I'm going to talk to him right away. And if you want the information. For this recipe, we'll be glad to send it out to you. I already sent out a bunch of them this week to my guests, so it's good whether you think we did a good job or not. <laughs> Stay with us. <laughs>You know, I love pastors. Um, my grandfather was one. I have a copy of his ordination certificate dated 1895. And my dad, my uncles, my son, and my husband. So I know what you go mm -hmm. through. Right. And um, this book, I, I just want to read one sentence you picked yep. that kind of set the stage. It is most assured that Satan delights in a dirty bride, a church that has grown lax, abandoning her call to holiness, unkempt and mismanaged her members meander in and out of the disciplines of the faith with little if any accountability boy that's that Mouthful. is powerful <laughs> yeah um what was it was there one incident one thing that just said you need to write this book 
Well, you know, I've been in ministry about 35 years, and I, I think one of the things is being in such a different variety of ministries, being in the uh, bush of Africa, in Zimbabwe, as well as in townships around Harare, Zimbabwe. Then, you know, being in Cornwall, England, being in a, in a, in a European church that was almost on the verge of closing with a small remnant, watching it begin to grow. Uh, being in an inner city church for the last, well, 17 years, as well as a chaplain in the army. You know, you just, you, you just get an opportunity to see the church in, in a variety of different places and in different conditions. And one of the things that just over and over again was evident to me was that a lot of times people don't change. You know, yeah. people come to Christ but they never really change. A man says, well, you know, I just got an anger problem. I've always had it. My dad had it. My granddad, my granddaddy had it. You know, the anger just runs in my family. And for a lot of people, they never really, really never move beyond some of those personality quirks or those behavioral patterns. They're not converted. Yeah. You know, uh, wasn't it Francis Schaeffer, I have to paraphrase because I have it memorized, said that, um, Salvation without conversion is useless if there's, yeah. if there's not a change. Well, I think if, if you look, the word holy in the Greek is hagios, and the word sanctification is hagiosmos. It's, sanctification is the process by which Christ is conforming us into oh. His image. <laughs> but that is impossible without confrontation. We need, and I call it in the book, Voices of Truth, we need those people that we allow, we have to invite into our lives to help us be conformed. You know, a lot of times we see sanctification as something, well, it's the Holy Spirit and I've just got to sit quietly while it does it. Uh, I think theologically it's called quietism, but that's really not scriptural. You know, part of the process of relationships as iron sharpens iron, we are looking and observing qualities that are unchristlike and maybe a brother or sister, we need to bring that to their attention. And yet it's awkward. We're not, we're not comfortable mm -hmm. doing that. And yet if we don't do it, we rob them of really growing as a believer. And they remain, as Paul said in Corinth, to the church of Corinth, you know, they remain spiritually immature, remain babies. You know, Paul said, I want to give you meat, but I can't do they it. They can't digest it. Yeah. Um, we have, and you can watch them on television, big churches uh, where the messages are just kind of hope you feel better after mm -hmm. you've heard it. Um, I've heard that the word is, you know, you're supposed to comfort the afflicted and afflict right. the comfortable right. uh, with the word. And not a whole lot said about the blood of Jesus or the cross. And God would only know, but how many of these people really are, mm. really are born again? Yeah. Well, if you look at Jesus, he was very confrontational. Oh, uh, yeah. You know, that was a quality of him. You know, in John 6, 66, he was so confrontational. And at one point, the Bible says that the multitudes that he had fed began to leave. You know, could you imagine the average pastor of a large mm -hmm. church preaching a sermon that people got up and walked out? Yeah. And yet, when you look at the prophets of the Old Testament, you look at the, you know, those men and women of the New Testament, you look again at Jesus Christ, there was a confrontational nature. In fact, I, I make the statement in the book that confrontation, the church is a place of confrontation. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I got sick in 1994 and have dealt with a problem I picked up from while I was in Zimbabwe. I went to my doctor one time and he sat down, crossed his legs, looked at me and said, had his clipboard and said, well, have you done this? I said, no. He said, well, have you done this? I said, no. He said, well, have you, and he just, and finally he just stopped. He closed his, put the paper back down, looked at me and said, if you're not going to listen to me, then you need to find you another doctor. Now, when I go to a doctor, I expect to be confronted. If I'm, he's concerned about my physical health. So a hospital, a doctor's office is a place of confrontation. And a church, I heard a preacher say, Dr. Ron Herod said one time to a bunch of young preacher boys, he said, when people come to church, they ought to be mad, sad, or glad. 
And or maybe when they leave. <laughs> well, that, that's what he was saying, yeah. you know. But a lot of times people leave and they, they're they none of the above. Nothing's happening. You know, they're just kind of apathetic and different. And uh, so the church is a place of confrontation. The pastor is a person of confrontation, you know. And uh, um, there's a guy named Jack Canfield. He wrote a book called The Success Principles. And he basically did this in, in conferences in the business, you know, a business conference. He would take, um, he would pick a person out of the conference and he would say, you're going to represent a goal that I have for my life. Then he would blindfold himself and he would put this person out in the room and then he would blindfold it, would have to navigate and try to reach his goal. And he told this person, he said, now you're to say one of two things, on course, or off course. And, and so you see him blindfolded, he mm -hmm. makes his way, he finally arrives to his, his goal. And then he looks at the people and he says, what did you hear the most? They said, off course. There you go. And he said, as a, as a believer, well, I say as a believer, if we're going to be conformed into the image of Christ, then we need to allow people that will look at us and say, you're off course right now. You know, there's so many components to this and just painting with a broad brush, so please, pastors, don't write to me. <laughs> painting with a broad brush, doesn't that confrontation, it's best if it comes from a pulpit. My dad used to say, it's best if you can handle things from the pulpit. And I know exactly what he meant, right. that th that word of God that is sharp and it cuts deep, accompanied by the Holy Spirit coming from the man of God, for that place and time, that's the best way mm -hmm. to do it. You yeah. might have to do yeah. it one-on-one, -on -one, but that's the very best way to do yeah. it. Well, you know, and that, that's part of preaching. So, yeah. so then the follow-up would be, are they really preaching sin in the pulpit, against sin and, and its uh, ramifications? Mm -hmm. Well, I think there again, you know, that's, that's the most difficult part of pastoring. The reality is, is that a pastor is like anyone else. He wants to be liked. Mm -hmm. He wants approval. He wants to grow denominationally now. You, you take, I'm Southern Baptist. Who's recognized? Churches that are growing, dynamic, reaching people. But there's a danger because when that becomes your methodology, your motive, then there, the danger is that you begin to compromise in that area of confrontation. You begin to tweak a message. You begin to think, well, I don't want to make this person angry or that person. And you become non-confrontational, which, which is a quality that's alien to the scripture. And, mm -hmm. um, well, the, um, that pastor, if you to find that, that place where you're really, you're pounding sin and there's no excuse for it. It's gotta be repented and all. But also that the, that the love mm. for those people mm. accompany that. That's, yeah. that's the line that, that's probably the most uh, successful. Now, also culture. Yeah. We, our churches, our pastors battle a culture that so brainwashes people. And that is, you don't ever want to hurt little Johnny's feelings. So how often do you hear in the news or even in a court or whatever, somebody who's offended? Oh, yeah, yeah. So that, that bleeds right into the church, doesn't it? Well, you know, again, in the area of confrontation, if you love people, you know, I've used the example of my wife. If my wife had a neon green bright dress that was just ridiculously, you know, in ugly. color. <laughs> and it was just ugly. But she had bought it. And, and you know, a, what a woman will do, she comes before we're getting ready to go to church and she says, what do you think of it? Well, in that moment, as a husband and as a man, if she likes it, but I know it's ugly mm -hmm. and it, it doesn't present her tell well. Tell me what you'd say, come on. Then, well, you know, I'm probably gonna tell her the truth. <laughs> but, uh, but anyway, you know, um, in that moment, I may not be alike. She may get frustrated with me if I look at her and say, well, I'll be honest with you, it's, not a, it's, it's ugly. Mm -hmm. She gets mad, she goes back, she changes clothes, she gives me the silent treat, treatment on the way to church. Mm -hmm. But my motive is I love her and I don't want her to be embarrassed or ashamed. Mm -hmm. If I allow her for the sake of my <laughs> own peace and comfort, if I allow her to go to church looking that way, and mm -hmm. I see people quietly and laughing, you know, mm -hmm. saying, look mm -hmm. at her, you know, then the reality is, is that I've just simply compromised in order for peace. There are a lot of preachers mm -hmm. 
And there are a lot of us, not just, not just preachers, but even as a believer, how many times do we, are we in a workplace where we see something in a brother or sister in Christ mm -hmm. that needs to be confronted? But our tendency is we don't want to, we want to be liked. Mm -hmm. You know, we yeah, want to be approved. Yeah, but you know, they, you got to shine the light on that and, and get over it. Mm -hmm. um, there, there's something bigger going on. I was, I've been a minister of music in a couple, three churches, and um, I was in one church that they would have been a little bit different than my, the church I'd come from on divorce and remarriage and right. that kind of thing. And so I was, um, I was the head of the music, and these, this couple got together, had no business getting together. I mean, mm -hmm. it was wrong, 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 right. won't go into it. And so um, I, you know, I talked to them all, and uh, they left. The pastor buzzed my office one day and said, uh, you know, they've left the church. And I said, well, you told me I was the pastor over this group. He said, you are, and I back you 100%. They got married, they came back. Within six months, each of them came to me privately. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Said, it's not going well, will you pray? And I thought, you know, I can pray calluses on my kneecaps, but you're in the harvest. Right. And I was trying I was mm -hmm. trying to keep you from that harvest. And mm -hmm. it's tough. It's mm -hmm. hard to do that. Well, and it affects marriage. You know, there's a point. This book is not only about receiving confrontation. It's also about learning how to give it, but yeah. doing it in a Christ-like way. You know, a lot of times people will say, well, you know, my confrontational partner is my wife or my husband. Well, that's not true. Most men and women who marry, a woman marries a man, he's violent, he's got a temper, he's got a personality that just causes some problems at work and other places. Mm -hmm. She tries to address that in the beginning, but she soon learns that his angry outburst almost is not worth it. So she just quietly lives in that marriage. And let me say this, mm -hmm. where there's no confrontation, where there's no honesty, there's a loss of intimacy. Right. She lives in that relationship, but in reality, she's frustrated. Mm -hmm. And, the, you know, his boss may give him a dressing down. He comes home mm -hmm. and she could say, well, you know, honey, he's right. But there's a cost to that. You know? I've been rebuked a few times and they were right. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's, it's awful hard on the flesh. But oh, yes. yes. Uh, if you just tuned in, I'm talking to Dr. Jeff Parker with an amazing, wonderful experience in ministry around the world going to put his website up. The name of the book is Killing the Church <coughs> and the, because of, really because of the failure to confront. I, I urge any leadership to have this in their, in their library. Every lay person ought to read. I think sometimes lay people have no idea what holiness is all about and uh, the church uh, is, is very much lacking in it. Because the culture has a huge mm -hmm. effect on the church, probably more than when I was growing up, because of television, technology, right. and how things pound you all the time. But it doesn't change the Word of God. It doesn't change no, that. No, it doesn't. You know, Michael Ower, you know, the, yeah, I know the character behind the blind side. Michael Ower said in every attempt that he did, that he tried to confront his biological mother. Mm -hmm. He tried to, to rebuild that relationship. Ultimately, he said, I realized that that relationship, her relationship with her children didn't matter to her. Mm -hmm. Sometimes people have to confront someone and yeah. risk the loss of the relationship in order to tell the truth. Yeah. In other words, That's pastor, good. Tom Riger made a statement. I think it's in Breaking the Fear Barrier or something. Mm -hmm. He said the first conflict that a leader will have, the first fear that a leader faces is the fear of loss. Mm -hmm. And sometimes a pastor and those people in ministry don't want to risk the loss of membership in order to speak yeah. the truth. Yeah, because they'll be welcomed in the next church singing in the choir in two weeks. That's right. However, uh, what kind of a relationship do you have if you're kind of tiptoeing on eggshells, you know, to try to keep someone you have a superficial, yeah. on-the-surface mm -hmm. relationship. You, what you develop in, in the average church is uh, mediocrity, but what you develop even more is a level of hypocrisy, mm -hmm. where we just, we realize there are things that are wrong in our lives. We don't allow, again, again, this is inviting. This is what Jack Canfield said in his book, The Success Principles. 
it's inviting that input into our life. It's, mm -hmm. it's looking at a dear friend and saying, I don't know what it is, but I'm having problems mm -hmm. at work. Or I don't know what it is, I'm having problems with, you know, whatever relationship. I, I think there's something in me. Can you help me? You, when yeah. you give somebody that permission who loves you and can speak the truth in love, then what happens is that's when a person really begins to look, start looking like Christ. Yeah, it's so much the way it's presented. Right. Because the truth will set you free. Mm -hmm. The that's truth right. will set you free. Um, and can, I, I, can I add sure, something? There? Sure, because we just got about a minute. Go ahead. Can, can I add something? One of the great things, I think it's in Genesis 48 or 49, mm -hmm. Jacob calls his sons together to bless them. He looks at Reuben and he basically says to Reuben, he, he, he kind of admonishes Reuben. Of course, Reuben had done some things he shouldn't yeah. do. Then he, then he admonished Levi and Simeon. He told them they were men of violence and that he wouldn't go into their tent. And I, when I was sitting there and I read that, I thought, well, that's not a blessing. Mm -hmm. Truth is always a blessing. Yeah. It that's is always good. A I never yeah. thought of that. Absolutely. And to any of the lay people out there and the preacher preaches something from the Word of God, the truth, and it offends you, you better look in the mirror, yeah. really. Uh, the only people who get offended with a message on tithing are those who don't tithe. Right. You, uh, you know, point. it's pretty yeah. simple. So. Uh, it's all the way around and it's not just the preacher, the pastor confronting, it can be another saint of God, but they really need to pray, be That's prayed right. up, That's right. know what they're doing and um, you know, not go in mm -hmm. like a, a tornado because that's, right. that's, that's right. not going to be received. I'm so sorry yeah. we're out of time. That's this is all such, right. such an important, important uh, subject. And I hope that you've taken note of that uh, website and you'll follow through because um, I believe this is a man that's had every right to write, to write this book. And I hope that it just spreads through the body of Christ and wakes us all up because you know what? America needs a revival. America needs repentance. And it's got to come from the churches. It's got to come from the people of God who are bold and uh, you don't really care if you're like that much or any of those things. You can stand on the Word of God, and when it's all said and done, all shaken down, you're not, you're not going to regret it. Yes. I am sorry we're out of time, but we are. So join me next time, friends, remembering there's no higher calling than that of a homekeeper. God bless you. If you should miss a homekeeper's program, you can catch up by going to www.ctnonline.com. Click on CTN Programs and then on Homekeepers.